Welcome to our Youth Services MLIS Pathway Q&A with Advisors. Today's workshop is the final workshop in our Pathway series introducing the different MLIS career pathways, where you will get an insight perspective from instructors who have worked in specific fields. Let's get started with the agenda. Today's agenda consists of an <clears throat> excuse me, of an overview of the Youth Services Pathway, which courses students can consider, how students use the skill set, and then we'll meet faculty with expertise in this area who have made themselves available to answer your questions. So what does a youth services librarian do? Well, the youth services career pathway is designed to prepare students for positions as children's and or young adult librarians or coordinators and public library youth specialists on a regional or state level or as information professionals and organizations principally serving youth. Librarians embedded in community agencies serving foster youth and juvenile detention centers, as well as to offer library general, generalist appropriate coursework to prepare for serving a public that includes youth. So here's a list of core theory and knowledge that students pursuing the pathway would benefit from in building a career in this area such as knowledge of developmental needs and processes, leading to an understanding of the behaviors exhibited by youth, create a coordinated plan for programming and outreach to youth, presentation skills relevant to a youth audience, including but not limited to reading aloud, storytelling, and book telling. Students following the Youth Services Pathway need to enroll in at least one programming foundational course, either Info 260A, Programming and Services for Children, or Info 261A, Programming and Services for Young Adults. In order to gain access to services and programming seminars such as 267, which is Seminar and Services to Children and Young Adults, which is available in a variety of rotating topics, and 263, Materials for Children, as well as 265, Materials for Young Adults. Info 260 or 261 are also prerequisites for Info 271, which is the genre and topics in youth literature. So now I'll turn it over to Sheila. Thanks so much, Taryn. Whether your interests are working with youth, lie in the emergence, emerging technology, STEM literacy, summer learning, cross-cultural community building, youth activism, or many of the other important aspects of supporting our youth, note that skills built working with youth could also translate very well into library leadership skills. In preparing for this presentation, I found this... Um, survey that had been done in 2020, um, where the director of the Cochise County Library District stated, skills that were listed most often by the survey participants really overlapped a great deal with my own impressions during my career. And these were communication. This was mentioned absolutely the most across the board, creativity, flexibility, empathy, and the ability to juggle multiple projects and priorities. This was a survey of library leaders and administrators who had come from a youth services background. Now, becoming familiar with the Association for Library Services to Children's Competencies for Librarians Serving Children in Libraries and the Young Adult Library Services Association's Teen Services Competencies for Library Staff Competencies document, which are all linked on our iSchools Youth Services pathway on our website. And then mapping these areas to your own skill sets, as well as the iSchool class offerings will help you to build a strategic list of electives in this pathway. Now you could proactively create job alerts on Indeed or other job search aggregators with keywords so that you could keep your eye on the types of jobs in public library settings that might be available in your area. Now here are two examples, uh, the one on the left from CLA's um, job search tool and the one on the right from Indeed. 
Now note that we ask um, employers, we ask employers who contact us here at the iSchool uh, about posting positions um, to, to post those on our SJSU Handshake platform. Um, these are There are many other recommendations that you can look at in our career development section of our own iSchool website. And you can read sample job descriptions to keep track of the knowledge, skills, and abilities that are listed in your targeted position types. Note that the position on the right-hand side is not in a library. However, it's an inclusion specialist at YMCA of the East Bay. The pretty great um, starting salary. And if you look at the skills and the knowledge base for this position um, description, it could be um, a great match for someone who's interested in working with youth, but maybe not in a traditional library context. And now you all have the great opportunity to get to hear tips and recommendations from experts in this pathway. First, they will introduce themselves and let you know a little bit about their own background in this youth services pathway, the skills and the topics that they feel, feel are quite timely. Um, they'll tell you a little bit about the courses that they teach that are part of this pathway and whatever recommendations they might have for folks looking to build a career in this area. And then we will um, switch to more of a Q&A format after each professor has had their portion of the presentation. So with that, I think we're ready to turn it over to Dr. Anthony Bernier. Well, thank you, Sheila, and thank you, uh, Taryn, for, for organizing our presentations today. I really uh, appreciate that. I think it's I think it's useful for students to have an idea um, about what they're going into in terms of these pathways to help you, as uh, Sheila suggested, make strategically important decisions as you go through our, our relatively short master's program. Um, I am Dr. Anthony Bernier, and um, I uh, teach actually two different courses in the Youth Services Pathway, um, but I have an overall philosophical approach uh, to the work that I do in terms of teaching and preparing students to enter the field, and that's this notion of thriving within limits. Um, youth services people in particular never get the kind of resources that we feel we need to do the best job in the world, uh, and that will never change. And as a consequence, we should be preparing ourselves to thrive within whatever limits we face, uh, limits of all kinds, not just money, but staff, space, uh, materials, um, other kinds of community capacities. So we enter into the work with um, preparing young people with this notion in mind. As professionals, it's still our obligation to do the best we can to thrive within whatever limits we have, even as we try to expand the resources that we um, we have access to. So the first of the two courses I teach is, uh, the first one is to Info 261 here. We have another uh, course, 260A, which is the uh, answer uh, for this foundations course for children. The one I focus on is for young adults or the people we refer to as teenagers or adolescents. And it's called Foundations, uh, Programming and Services to Young Adults. And those are the uh, those are the basic things that you need before you take some of the more uh, advanced um, or specialized courses in literature or other kinds of services, storytelling, and so on. So you take either 261 or 260A uh, before you move forward. But the notion of thriving within limits is a, uh, a, a concept that we drag through well, both of the courses that I teach uh, for the reasons that I, I mentioned before, that we just never, we just will never get all of the resources that we feel we need, but we still have an obligation to, to do well with young people and the people who, who care about them. The other course I teach is really in the research methods series. Uh, our San Jose State Program, our school, offers the widest selection of applied research courses of any of the LIS programs in the country. Um, I teach uh, two of them, but the one for the youth services is this applied research methods for youth services. And, and that includes services from uh, uh, early childhood all the way up through, through the, the advanced um, uh, teenage years. And what I do here is take a, a critical youth studies look 
And imagine um, the experience that young people have within institutions uh, from a critical perspective so that we can uh, bring all of our our uh, scholarly and professional tools to working with young people. It also includes an institutional critique, the historical relationship that young people, in particular teenagers, have had um, with libraries, not all of it good. And we talk about why that is and how to get through that. And then the course is evidence-based, which means we look at actual evidence and data in terms of trying to A, make decisions about what we're doing, but also B, evaluating what we do so that we're not just doing something because we did it last year or because that's what my supervisor told me to do, but it's evidence-based. So whatever programs and services that uh, professionals deliver, we do so with a professional volition based upon evidence, not just um, um, history or, or myth or tradition. Um, I have a long experience in serving young people directly. I have uh, 14 years, both as a young adult specialist librarian and also as a young adult services supervisor, where I developed an entire youth YA services department for a midsize uh, public library. And then I'm very proud of the fact that I designed the very first purpose-built young adult space, and that was for the LA Public Library. Kevin here is with us today. He's from Burbank. You might want to take a look at the LA Public Library's Teenscape downtown at the main library, the Central Library in downtown LA, because that's the, the space that, that I worked on and brought into uh, brought into the library world. Um, I have um, a number of areas of, of young adult services research that I work on. Um, spaces, of course, I continue to um, lecture and study and um, consult with architecture firms on designing young adult spaces with young people. And then I do some, I'll continue some research on the volunteer experience for young people and how we invert that from uh, not looking to find young people to help us, but imagining the volunteer experience in such a way that it helps young people. So an inverted model from, from the volunteer idea with, with adults. And then teen advisory groups, uh, as well as studying a uh, youth curriculum. And then we do a lot of uh, exercising in hot topics, particularly strong uh, these days. Um, I published two uh, edited collections recently. One was Transforming Young Adult Services in 2020. And the most recent one just published now is Young Adult Services Challenges and Opportunities. And that's going to be the, the book I work on in my, with uh, as a required reading for my 261A class. Um, I have an, I also serve in a number of uh, uh, service roles for our school, as you can see here. Um, uh, the one most pertinent is the Youth Services Program Advisory Committee, in which we invite uh, uh, youth services people from across the country to meet with us twice a year to review the curriculum that we offer in our youth services pathway and get people who are hiring our graduates to tell us what they think about what we're doing. Um, that's the most pertinent for this. And as you can see, also, I've, I've uh, been very fortunate and privileged to receive a number of awards from uh, from the school. So that's uh, that's my profile for the youth services pathway. And I'm glad you're here with us. I'm glad you're doing this uh, review. It get, it'll give you an opportunity to make some some very good choices as you move through the program. Um, OK, thanks, Sheila. OK, thank you, Dr. Bernier. Next, you're gonna hear from Dr. Joni Bodar. Hi, everyone. Um, I have been involved with the uh, Youth Pathway since I came to San Jose State back in um, 2003 when I was a part-time faculty member and then when I became full-time in 2006. I teach a number of things that um, focus on different parts of youth services. Um, the first one that I want to talk about is uh, Information 281, which has to do with book talking and book trailering. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the term book talking. Book trailering is the same thing, except you do it on uh, a video screen, just like you would do uh, movie trailers. And I teach a course in that 
gives people a chance to uh, write book talks and perform them and learn the different ways of putting together a book talking presentation. Um, some of the the tips and techniques that I have used um, since the 70s when I began to do book talking. And I also have um, uh, two series of books that were published by H.W. Wilson. They are unfortunately mostly out of print now, but um, when they were when they were in print, they were considered to be um, the the standard for for that area of young adult librarianship. Book trailering gives people a chance to uh, put together a brief video presentation that includes both uh, live shots, still shots, and um, an, an audio an audio part of the format, so that you are able to the students are able to. Uh, put together uh, a group of book trailers that could, for instance, be used as a part of a book talking presentation in a school classroom. Uh, it could be on closed circuit TV. It can be uh, streamed in various ways. So there are a wide variety of things that you can do both with written book talks and, <clears throat> pardon me, video book trailers. Um, I thought the class that I teach most frequently is collection management, which uh, looks at how to put together a collection and how to maintain it, how to um, work with the various departments in the library that have to do with collection management. And the way that the, the unique um, twist that I put on it in my class is that I have students uh, put themselves into teams and each team of four or five students uh, writes a collection policy manual during the entire semester. And that's that's pretty generic. But the unique part is that I want students to create their own library or archive or um, school library, their own collection. And I want them to to create it like um, a fictional library. Uh, so you would have, I've had libraries that existed at the North Pole and their, um, their uh, community consisted of uh, elves and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Claus, of course, and uh, other kinds of uh creatures that live at the North Pole, polar bears and and um, reindeer and so on. And what they what this particular one did was look at the different parts of the community and set up collection management services for each part of the community. Um, there have also been uh, libraries uh, based on Sherlock Holmes and the library and archive that he and his descendants set up along with his partner, um, Dr. Watson. And I thought for a minute, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, not gonna remember that. Um, and they had to, uh, they had first set it, the this group had first set up their their uh, library as a library that existed in the uh, days of Sherlock Holmes. But 
when they got when the team got to the point where they had to start looking at electronic services, they realized that they had to do a little bit of tweaking. And so it became the archive of uh, Sherlock Holmes, but also the library of his descendants uh, that existed down into our current times. Um, so I think that it's a lot of fun you get to be creative um, and you can focus your uh, library on children and teenagers if you want to. A lot of, um, a lot of teams uh, look at a young adult department in a public library or, or a high school library um, and they are able to make it uh, just as unique as they want to be able to make it. Then I teach a course in reader's advisory work. Um, this, again, is something that is not within the, the standard YA curriculum, but it does give you lots of inf information on how to work in a reader's advisory uh, situation including how to do book discussion groups and uh, both um, virtual discussion groups and actual face-to-face uh, -face discussion groups. And then I teach a couple of seminars uh, in 267. I teach uh, a seminar in uh, intellectual freedom, uh, no, Beth teaches a seminar in intellectual freedom. I teach the seminar in controversial literature. And um, I do that based on some of my research that went into my most frequent two books. One focuses on uh, supernatural creatures in um, young adult lit, including uh, werewolves and vampires and and angels and other kinds of things. And one on uh, actual real human monsters in uh, children and young adult literature. These, I, I think that these are really important because teens today and children as well are going through a lot of um, Difficult circumstances, shall we say, uh, based on our uh, national culture and also on world culture. And the other thing that I do that is kind of interesting is that I am the editor for Young Adult Library Services, uh, which is the formal uh, journal of the Young Adult Services Association of um, the library, uh, the American Library Association. So um, you will have uh, perhaps a better chance than most to um, contribute to that journal. And if you're interested in writing something for it, um, our com the next issue coming up is on diversity. And we're doing a wide variety of aspects of diversity. So you can um, get in touch with me about that. Um, my uh, email is on the, the website. And I believe that's all. And so I will um, pass it along to Beth. Hi, everybody. Um, glad to be with you today. Um, I teach. Um, basically three classes per semester. My, my uh, constant class is, is Information 260, which is Programming and Services for Children. Um, as a former uh, children and, um, and YA uh, teen services person, as well as a, a manager of collection development, acquisitions, and technical services for a school district in Denver, Colorado, 
Um, my experience basically um, is is really focused on uh, the practical. I like to do, I guess I look at myself as a scholarly practitioner in that I want students to understand uh, why we study the things that we study, what the current research is. But I also like to bring a very practical element to all of my classes so that when you are either working in a library or you you may not have any experience, you may be a student that's just coming into the program and you've never worked in a library before, or you may be uh, quite experienced and have just gone back to work on your MLIS. So my students um, actually um, uh, are across a wide spectrum, which I, I really, really enjoy. But Information 260 is basically what I call a gateway course. It, it, it basically helps you get into classes that have prerequisites that, that require either 260A or, as Dr. Bernier was talking about, 261A. Um, but I have a real practical side to programming and services, materials for young adults, uh, my intellectual freedom seminar, uh, you know, all my classes in that when you take classes from me, you're going to get very practical assignments that um, hopefully you'll enjoy there. I look on the more creative side of, of, of taking a topic um, much like a 12 month programming plan, which is part of uh, the final culminating assignment for a 260A in my class. Uh, and you build a 12 month, um, you know, uh, uh, programming and services uh, for children, um, which you could actually, um, you know, show to an employer or actually use if you were building your own 12 month programming plan. I also teach, um, one of my big loves is, is young adult uh, materials, and I still teach young adult materials uh, once a year, uh, and uh, I thoroughly enjoy it. And again, as uh, Joni was talking about uh, with a lot of her creative assignments, um, you know, the 265 gives the opportunity for students to develop their own uh, mini database, mini collection, as it were, uh, based on readings throughout the semester. I also um, helped uh, develop and create the intellectual freedom uh, and young adult um, class. Uh, this is in conjunction with ALA, uh, Office of Intellectual Freedom. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and uh, very small class uh, usually, but it's more like a, a seminar, a really in-depth look at intellectual freedom as it pertains to youth. Um, I also helped develop an early childhood literacy class, and Dr. Bodar was involved in this as well. Um, we decided that there was a definite a gap in um, literacy and young adult, uh, children's and young adult in our program, and we wanted to offer a early literacy class that could also uh, be attached to public libraries, or I do have some school people do take that class as well. And then my all-time favorite, having been a children's librarian, is my materials for uh, for children's class, which is Info 263. And again, much like the materials for young adults, um, we look at all kinds of um, you know issues that are uh, surrounding. Uh, you know, there's a lot of controversy going on now, and we we do build that into the course. We 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 look at challenges. We look at why things are challenges. Um, the other thing that I do that um, is a little bit unique now in the program is I still have mandatory uh, guest speakers to where students have to come twice a semester um, for two different speakers. I try to get people that are cutting edge or uh, can come and talk about best practices um, in, in YA and children's. <clears throat> and so basically, um, if you take classes from me, you're going to get a lot of research, a lot of look at scholarly articles in the field, but you're also going to get a very practical application um, that you can carry forth into your career. So that's a little bit about me, um, and I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Taryn or Sheila. Well, great. Um, both of you, do uh, Dr. Bodar and, and Beth Renestas, have a very impressive portfolio of courses and topics. Unfortunately, Dr. Bernier has told us he had to leave um, 
our session unexpectedly. I did put a note in our chat that you can contact him by email for advising. Um, we're at the time now where we're going to open it up to questions um, from anyone who would like to ask advising questions or career questions to our two panelists. So if you want to head on over to the Q&A section, um, the Q&A widget at the bottom of your um, screen and drop us some questions and let us know if it's for either one of our two panelists or um, either in particular. Um, I guess I'll start by asking, um, Beth, do you have any particular ways that you like to work with advisees, um, whether it's by email or Zooms? Well, I usually, um, when someone contacts me, um, I ask what's most convenient for them because um, I'm I'm willing to do um, you know uh, different formats. Um, we usually end up in Zoom mainly because I can share my screen. They can share theirs if we're if we're looking at any of the forms they've been filling in or um, you know tracking their classes. And so um, I really uh, leave it up to the the student that's contacting me and what they're most comfortable with. Great. Right. Okay, I see we've had a few questions come in. Dr. Bodar is answering one. Um, we'll go to Anonymous. Are there any courses that are not specific to youth services that you'd recommend for folks interested in youth services and public libraries in particular? So I guess we'll stop, um, start with um, Dr. Bodar. Would you like to start? And then we'll go to Beth after that. I'm not muted now. Um, you. Yes. Great. Um, I think that my collection, collection management course, as I said earlier, is a really good one for um, people wanting to work with children or teens because you have uh, a chance to actually put together something that you would be able to use, as uh, Beth mentioned, with her classes. Uh, you come out with a product that is something that um, you can show to, uh, you know, in an interview situation to prospective employers. Um, you can you can you can get some actual experience uh, in class that you can put into action when you're when you're on the job. Um, I think I I don't like to have assignments that um, don't have a meaning that 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 are are things that you cannot um, that you cannot make use of when you're a librarian on the job. And so um that's one of the that's one of the reasons why I structure that class the way that I do. Um, the uh, my RA class is another one that you can take. It's uh, it is um, aimed at at uh, adult services, but if you tell me that you want to want to focus it a little bit more closely on teen services, then that is certainly something that you can do. Um, I think any of the literature courses, including the various special topics, is something that would um, be very useful to you. You're going to be able, when you're a children or young adult librarian, you're going to be able to, you're going to have to do programming, you're going to have to do um, a summer reading game. You may have to do a winter reading game. You're going. You're going to have to set up different kinds of activities for your community. In other words, for the the people that you work with at your library. And um, so you need to have some kind of an idea of how to do that. And um, 
working working with this um working with the the readers advisory group or working as Beth does in in her programming and services classes um it, you you end up getting real specific information that you can put into uh play as when you're when you're um when you're on the job. And I'm just scanning down here uh, to uh, Latanya's uh, question. I think that a lot of times um, you can you can take a a uh, youth perspective on from just about you know, on a wide variety of different classes. Um, just because they aren't in the youth pathway, um, that doesn't mean that um, they won't be valuable to you. Uh, but I'm going to stop that answer and let Beth respond um, because I think she has a little bit more specific um, information. For you. Well, I think Joni, you covered it. Uh, you covered it really e e extensively. I think one of the classes that um, I like students that um, I advise to take a look at if they haven't already is the culturally diverse communities class, and I may not be getting the title it, it, it entirely correct. Um, any any place that most people are coming out of and into are going to have a lot of different um, different types of communities within the library to work with. Um, and so coming, coming in with some uh, basic knowledge about um, what those communities are and how best to serve them uh, is, is something that um, I've, I've had feedback from students who have taken that class and it fit really nicely into, into the YA um, and children's uh, you know, tracks within, within the, the, you know, within the iSchool. Um, you know, I, I look at, you know, t telling students, you know, you know, follow, follow your heart a little bit uh, when you're looking at your program and to, to kind of expand your horizons. Like, you know, if you don't know what you're going to be when you grow up, which is one of the things that some students come in and say, I really don't know if I want to, you know, work with teens. I don't know if I want to work with kids. Um, is is getting them off on the right foot so they can make the right decisions for themselves is by you know just doing a general overview or a walkthrough of the courses that are that are offered and and kind of you know pulling out of pull, pulling out of each student um, you know what are what are their interests what are they looking at what would they like to do uh, in the program and that that opens up a whole bunch of courses that are way beyond just what I teach or what Dr. Bernard Bernier teaches, excuse me, or what Dr. Bodart teaches and kind of gets the student to be a participant in their own in their own course development uh, as we as we go through an advisee advisor relationship. So, you know, that's what I would add to, you know, uh, everything that uh, and I agree with Joni um, on uh, everything that she said as far as what courses to take. Um, you know, if you if you really want to get the most out of the program, uh, it takes a little bit of work to to establish, you know, uh, your pathway, as it were. But once you have that established, then you kind of are following, um, you know, following really good uh, stepping stones towards getting your degree. OK, thank you. And I also wanted to mention, if I can is that, um, you know, folks can mix and match from more than one pathway, LaTanya, so you shouldn't worry too much. Um, that's how we diversify our skill set. In fact, taking some classes from the leadership and management pathway is not a bad idea. Um, I don't know, Beth, if you have suggestions as far as project management um, or the financial um, management type of classes, if you found that those, that skill set is also a plus for people um, managing a youth services department? Well, if you're going to do that, you need to have some kind of budgeting experience. Um, 
it can be very fundamentally, it can, it can be, you know, um, in my 260 class, one of the things that you have to do is you have to, um, you know, not only develop your 12 months of programming, but you have to attach, um, you know, a budget, which basically makes you think about how much things are going to cost. And then with that in mind, how are you going to sell your idea to your, you know, your supervisor if, if you're not the supervisor? But um, I also, uh, I also, you know, some people come in and they say, I don't know if I, you know, if I want to be in management or not. And uh, I have a management um, module in my 260 class, um, just kind of get people started to think about, you know, uh, what does that look like if I wanted to go and, and have the aspiration of, let's say, being a branch manager? What does that mean and what's entailed with that? I have guest speaker comes who um, basically uh, was, you know, uh, uh, has been in multiple, multiple uh, jobs that, that are management based. And her advice is always to take a management course if you possibly can in your undergraduate, I'm sorry, in your master's work. Um, so uh, that's just a, a, a little bit of advice that yes, you should, if you if you have that goal in mind or or even thinking about it, you should take advantage of, of classes in the program that, that look at finance or look at um, look at, uh, you know, issues in public libraries or um, mix and matching, like you said, Sheila, um, with with things that, you know, you might not think of if you're going through it and to take a look at those courses, too. I agree with what Beth is saying. Um, as, a, as a teen librarian, you may not think that you would go into management, that you would become uh, a branch manager or a library manager. But that certainly can happen, and it may be that that in order to uh, move forward in your career, that you have to um, get away from young adult services or children's services and move into a more managerial position. And if you've gotten at least a minimal amount of information in your program on uh, financial questions and how to how to set up a budget, how to uh, manage a, a particular library, manage a particular kind of library. That's that's going to be really valuable information um, in the future. Uh, I think that it's it's really important to remember that. Um, you are looking at your library education um, from, from from where you are right now. You you are not necessarily looking at it based on what I might do much further on in my career. Uh, when I was a baby librarian, I decided that. I wanted to be a young adult librarian, and uh, then I decided I wanted to be a young adult coordinator, and then I thought I would stop at that point. That was as high as I could get, and um, that turned out to not be the case at all. And uh, so giving yourself a variety of uh, experiences in your coursework that will be a applicable to what you might be doing <clears throat> um, 10 years from the time that you get your degree or 15 years down the road. Um, just, just getting some familiarity with managerial type information can be real, real valuable. Um, because you don't know, you don't know where you're go you're going to be. You don't know um, where your life is going, where your career is going, and so being able to get a lot of different kinds of, of experiences in your coursework, I think, is very is very important, and. Um, 
my 266 is is a chance for you to with your team pretend that you are um a manager of a library or a library system and you are writing a policy manual to be used in that system and that is something that will be that will be very valuable to you um when you get a little bit further down the road um And I was going to say something that was really pertinent and important. And I forgot. So I, when I think about it here in a minute, I'll, I'll bring it around again. But I, oh, I know what it was. Um, writing this policy manual is not just, you don't just get the product. You also get a team, a team experience. You also had the experience of working in a virtual team. And that is very valuable experience for someone that is going to be working in a wide variety of different kinds of library um, situations. So you know not just to work face to face with other people, but you also know how to um, start from zero, start from scratch, and create a, an 11 chapter policy manual that you would be able to implement in a real library. And that the process of creating that also gives you lots more information about how to work in virtual groups. And that's very, very valuable. Very good. Yes, we know from our MLIS skills at work report that employers are looking for those collaborative skills. Um, we have two more questions. So we'll start with what tips or advice would you give MLIS students wanting to choose YA services as a pathway, but they're seeing the struggle of teen engagement in public libraries? Beth, I'm going to let you speak on that first. Well, I'm going to tell you that um, working with teens is one of the most rewarding uh, and the most frustrating um, uh, things that you can have happen, mainly because just of the the ages uh, involved. Um, I think that you have to uh, be really aware of the psychological and um, developmental stages of, of uh, tweens and teens that are gonna come into your library. Um, you know, programming um, is, uh, you know, very, 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 very important for teens um, because they are coming into the library, um, you know, usually looking for something to do, whether it's an after school thing or they need homework help or they've just come in to, to sit and, and uh, be with their friends. But I do think you have to um, you have to think really uh, uh, hard about uh, what the spaces for teens look like. Um, you know, Dr. Bernier, uh, you know, and I, I think there's a couple other people that are teaching, um, you know, spatial design for teens um, and doing some pretty impressive work in those fields. So when you take um, 261, you're going to learn a lot more about that. Um, than you would have maybe 20 years ago. Um, but I think that you have to really understand that um, there's a lot of work to develop rapport with, with tweens and teens that come into your library, much more so than, than children who, who come for story time uh, and then homework help as they, as they move through school. Um, so my advice is to, uh, if you're going to follow the, the teen track, which I would recommend highly, I loved every minute of working with tweens and teens. Um, but I also um, like people to be um, aware that sometimes your administration is not as, as behind you as far as budgeting. And so there's that key on how do you, how do you have uh, some ability while you're in library school to learn how to develop a good budget, how to, 
how to, you know, talk about a budget, uh, how to talk about your needs, uh, and basically sell your sell your program to, you know, higher ups within your organization. Um, when you're not a higher up, you're just a youth, you know, you're you're a youth services librarian and you're asked to develop, say, for example, your library doesn't buy a summer reading program off the shelf, which is still possible to do with several companies, but you want they want you to develop your own and they want you to have a team component to it. So I tell people to really look, you know, clearly through all the courses that we uh, we offer and look at, you know, what do you think you might want to do? And if it's team services, you need to basically take, um, you know, as much programming as you can, uh, you know, uh, spatial design, budgeting, uh, and then understanding the developmental stages of teams uh, and uh, knowing how to work with teams. So that's just a little bit about what I would say about, you know, the answer to that question. And Joni, I'll turn it back over to you because I'm sure you have some thoughts. I agree with everything that Beth has said. Um, I think the, the most valuable way, uh, the most important thing for you to do while you're in school is to look for as many different varieties of experiences as you can find. Um, and as I was listening to Beth, I was also thinking about the um, current issue of Young Adult Library Services. This current issue, the one that's going to be coming out in maybe a month, um, <clears throat> maybe a little bit less, um, is focused on mental health for teens. And uh, some of my authors uh, wrote articles on how I run my teen library and what I do to get kids to invest in it. Um, and one, one article in particular uh, said, I, I don't tell them what they need to be doing. I say, what do you want to do? what will make it interesting to you. Because when they are doing what they want to do, they can get more enthusiastic about it and more invested in it. Um, another, uh, another article used an example of uh, a teen program that was uh, really popular within the community and um, its fame, so to speak, had spread uh, from further out than that, that just that one community. And uh, the author the, talked about a young woman who in the middle of the summer walked a number of miles uh, with a backpack in order to um, get to their teen library program and participate in it. And they were, she had run away from home and she she walked, as I said, many miles. I, I wanna tell you, it's, it was like 10 miles or something. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm, I'm apologize for my voice. Um, but I'm not positive of, of the exact length. But she she knew that she would be treated with respect and with dignity, and she would be able to choose to do something that she was interested in. Now, maybe that is doing some kind of a craft program, um, sitting down and uh, a, a group of girls sitting down and, and making those Taylor Swift thread bracelets or, or beaded bracelets or something like that while they talked about what is going on in their lives. I think the, the most important thing to take into consideration is letting letting teens choose what they want to do. 
you don't you don't set up a program and say, okay, here I've set this up. This is what you're supposed to do. And oh, by the way, you're supposed to like doing it as well. Um, you're not going going to be terribly successful. But if you say, what kinds of things are you interested in? What kinds of <clears throat> activities do you want to do? And how do you want to set up your teen advisory group or whatever um, name you want to call it? Uh, kid, teens are going to are going to respond to somebody that enjoys being with them, um, that will sit down and make thread bracelets with them. Um, that will uh, let them run their their advisory group meetings. That will that will let them decide what they're going to call their advisory group. Um, and how is that advisory group going to be organized? And and what's going to happen as part of uh, as part of the activities. Um, so I, I highly recommend that when that new issue of, of y'all's comes out, that you take a look at some of these, some of these articles. Um, they have a lot of um, really good tips on how, how to run a, a successful teen program with teams that are committed to it. Thank you. That was excellent. Well, we have about three more minutes and we've got two more questions. So we'll have to maybe kind of, this will be the lightning round. Um, question is, what advice do you have for folks in the program without any library experience? For example, classes to take and opportunities to seek out. Um, so do either of you have quick suggestions? I think some of the classes that we both talked about that, um, uh have have practical part, excuse me practical parts to them um would be really helpful another thing is another thing that could be helpful is to um if you have a library in your area that has a teen program um go to to that teen librarian and ask if you can um if you can volunteer. And so that would give you some some hands on experience. Um, and you can also, if if you don't want to do that or if that is not available, then you can do a. Uh, an internship um, and and get class credit for for learning what to do on the job. Um, that's that I'm finished. Well, I'm going to also just offer up something without getting uh, this overly complicated, but there is a, a way in the program that you can, um, once you get further in, you get rid of your, you know, prerequisites. Um, you, you need to look at, um, you know, one of the reasons why we developed the literacy course um, was because we saw a need for people to have more understanding of literacy based programming in libraries. Uh, and if you didn't get, you know, uh, that as an undergrad or in, in any jobs that you've had. So I would ask that you, you look for what is going to help strengthen you, um, as, as you, uh, you know, work your way through the program. So one of the courses I would definitely tell you to look at would be the literacy one. Um, there's also another opportunity that we don't talk about a lot, but I did want to throw this out is I work with special um, special studies students, which basically means you're getting a little further into the program, but it allows you to take um, the time to work with um, someone like myself or with, like with someone like Joni and basically delve deeper into an area that you, you know, would like to, um, you know, you'd like to study more. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of different things to it. So if you wanted to reach out, I'd be happy to tell you a little bit more about that. But I think um, get your feet wet, 
um, start taking, you know, the courses that, you know, you have to, you know, get out of the way and get yourself, you know, an appointment with an advisor so that you can look further down the roadway um, for when you're done with 260 or 261 and you, you've gotten, you know, you know, the other, uh, the other, you know, courses that, you know, you, you need to take before you can do what I used to call, um, you know, uh, an open elective selection, uh, which gets you closer to what you actually want to be when you're done. So those are, you know, my, my quick answers off the top of my head for that, for looking at the last two questions. And also, I think I just looked up here. What are the must courses? I think collection management, whether you take it from me or whether you um, take it from somebody else, collection management is a really valuable um, course because you are going to have to be creating collections no matter what kind of a job you're in. And uh, that is that is something that that you can really benefit from and and if you take it from me you can you can write your policy manual as a, a children or teen librarian okay well this has been a fascinating and really helpful discussion um, we are at the end of our time, unfortunately. So we do have a couple of questions that didn't get answered, but I'm sure that if you send us an email at ischool at sjsu.edu, be more than happy to answer those questions. I want to thank my co-moderator, Taryn, and as well our three faculty that joined us for the session. Um, this is our last uh, Lunch and Learn MLIS Pathway uh, Q&A uh, workshop in the series. We've completed all of the MLIS Pathways, but looking forward to some new topics this fall semester. And so you can check out a recording of this session in a couple of weeks on our YouTube um, playlist for outreach and advising. And thanks everyone for joining. We sure appreciated spending that time with you today.